Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Off mute. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for Maternal Early Warning Systems, providing equitable care at the bedside. Uh, just a little disclaimer before we get started. So this presentation includes information uh, from sources designated on the slides. If you'd like a resource list, um, we can provide that upon request. Through GoToWebinar, there is a panel on the side um, where you can type in any questions that you have during the webinar. Um, I think it's interesting to see where everyone is listening from. So if you want to go ahead and try the question box now and just let us know uh, where you're located. We'd love to see where everyone's from. Um, our presenter, Dr. Alana McGulrick, she's located in California. Uh, Karen Colega is in Florida, and I'm here in our headquarters in Cary, North Carolina. Um, wow, we have people from all over. I see Tulsa, Oklahoma, Vegas, Delaware, Virginia, Indiana, Tennessee, Idaho, Michigan, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Atlanta, Georgia, Wisconsin, New Mexico. Wow, thanks everyone for joining. Happy to have you here. Uh, so just a little bit about the host, Perigen. So Perigen has provided innovative software solutions for over 20 years with the mission of protecting all moms and babies. Um, PeriWatch Vigilance is our automated early warning system for mom and baby. It works with any existing electronic fetal monitoring software uh, to identify patients that may be developing a worsening condition. Um, and we are so excited that you guys are all here for this webinar today. It really demonstrates the passion we all have for maternal and fetal safety. Um, and we're just happy that we can all work together uh, to promote the safety for moms and babies. Um, so our presenter today is Dr. Alana McGulrick. So with significant perinatal experience, Dr. McGulrick leads Perigen's efforts to expand and enhance clinical training, customer outcomes reporting, and publishing. And our co-presenter is Karen Kalega. We call her KK. Um, she's a clinical engagement executive here at Perigen. Um, she's a subject matter expert for Perigen's obstetrical software and her expertise in obstetric path practices, regulations, and hospital operations improves prospective clients' engagements, adoption, and implementation. And now I am going to pass it over to Dr. Eliana Montgomery. I think you're on mute, Elaine. Yes, I'm on mute. Um, so I am probably going to have to shut my webcam down, but I wanted to say hello to everybody so that you knew there wasn't a phantom voice talking to you, that there's an actual person at the end of um, the, the telephone line here, um, because I have uh, an online school, high school going on next door, and of course, uh, my husband is also working from home um, due to COVID, so I have bandwidth issues. So. Welcome, and I'm going to shut my camera off. Okay. So uh, today's agenda is on the first slide for you um, here in on the screen. I just wanted to, again, welcome everybody for joining. We're going to be talking about a number of different subjects today. I tried to outline it um, to guide our conversation. Um, but of course, you know, there may be some, some opportunities here for questions. Um, certainly, we'd like to take some of your input at the end. So please feel free to use the uh, question and chat box at the, on the, um, on the GoToWebinar, and um, we will try to keep track of those as we move through the presentation. Um, also, uh, one thing to point out, the PowerPoint will be made available um, at the end of today's presentation. So, um, like any good educator, of course, I uh, set up uh, objectives for our um, discussion today. They're outlined um, here for you, and um, I hope that the curriculum does meet the objectives that are listed.
So for the remainder of today's discussion, I ask that you keep the word equitable and its definition at the forefront of your mind. Consider its application to nursing practice. How do we provide equitable care? Can we always be fair and impartial during each patient interaction? Perhaps at the conclusion of this presentation, you may have some ideas on how to address this on your unit. Um, for those that know me, I uh, am a very big fan of setting up flowcharts whenever I'm looking at a process or a policy and procedure development on the unit. So this may be very familiar to uh, some of my colleagues that I see have um, now populated our attendee list here today. So I'm sure they're having a, a little laugh, but I like to build upon, um, you know, the concepts that we're applying at the bedside through the flowchart so we, think we can ensure that we're actually meeting um, the needs and not hindering nursing practice, but helping nursing workflow. So uh, for today, in order to understand the pathways to equitable care strategies, um, let's consider where we are and start with that initial problem. And I think we can all agree that Unfortunately for us, it is the rising maternal morbidity and mortality rates here in the United States. I'm sure this graph is very familiar, but according to the CDC's most recent data, uh, the United States is experiencing a rise in the pregnancy-related mortality rate, which as of 2016 was recorded at 16.9 deaths per 100,000 live births. We are currently failing to meet the Healthy People 2030, which was um, reaffirmed and adjusted maternal mortality rate, which is set at 15.7. So continuing to remain idle and hoping that the situation will change uh, is going to leave our patients um, to be at risk for severe injury or unfortunately death. Another uh, great slide from the CDC that I'm sure you're all familiar with is that they've reported the current leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths in the United States include cardiovascular disease, infection, and maternal hemorrhage. And I know that we are all now familiar with the Joint Commission's new 13 elements of performance that are embedded in the Joint Commission Manual for accreditation. So these are, are certainly um, received the spotlight on our units as we prepare for those um, items to be surveyed. Obstetric safety strategies uh, must be multidisciplinary and supported by the healthcare organization. We cannot do this alone. It's important that our interventions implemented are impactful, but yet built upon a solid foundation of compliance. And I think this is where we run into trouble. So let's look a little bit at the background of maternal uh, morbidity and mortality. So according to McDormand et al. in 2016, 40 to 50% of maternal deaths were potentially preventable, and that despite access to the world's leading healthcare, the United States has not made a significant impact on obstetric patient safety. The research has shown that most preventable maternal events are preceded by changes in vital signs. Unfortunately, clinicians' failure to appreciate the patient's worsening condition has been a major contributor to the rising maternal morbidity and mortality rates. That near doubling of the national severe M&M rate has led government leaders to demand action. Although our patient M&M rates now have this spotlight, solutions have been left up to individual healthcare organizations, state collaboratives, and professional organizations to address. I think we can all agree this has led to multiple solutions but no standardized approach with a template that everyone can implement at the same time. So the significance of the problem. There are significant contributing factors that have led to the rising national maternal, maternal morbidity and mortality, mortality rates. The changing medical complexity of our obstetric patient. Unfortunately, our patients are not diagnosed with complex comorbidities, thus, negatively impacting maternal and fetal well-being. The pathophysiology of the leading comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and cardiac disease are greatly underappreciated and specifically to their impact of the physiological development, oxygenation, blood flow pathway to the fetus. We've been able to agree on the best approach to managing the maternal patient. This includes simple oxytocin checklists, 
um, and even further into complex disease processes such as preeclampsia. Limited research exists related to maternal early warning systems despite success with the adult non-pregnant patient population. Clinical experts in maternal fetal medicine have been unable to reach a consensus on the physiological parameter threshold. This has led to a variety of treatment protocols that vary across the country. So how can we ensure that equitable care is provided to all patients if we continue to use different approaches? In many cases of unexpected outcomes, early signs of impending maternal collapse went, went unnoticed. We've been lulled into complacency by the fact that these are rare events in perinatal and our patients have been historically healthy. This complacency contributes to the culture of normalized deviance, impacting our object, objectivity at the bedside. So addressing these two factors are the second step towards providing fair and equitable care. The landmark publication to Air is Human by the Institute of Medicine in 1999 was met with surprise by most of the healthcare community. Concerning findings by the book's authors painted a grim picture regarding unsafe healthcare practices, causing medical errors to be the third leading cause of death in the United States. This led to a direct push to analyze the cause of these errors and put into place safety barriers to protect our patients from human error. Most importantly, this book did not place blame on the clinician at the bedside, but at the systems and processes in place leading to the unexpected event. This shifted the focus from the human because we're not infallible, to the processes established by the organization. This redirection made it a priority of the organization and called upon leadership to support the necessary changes to standardize care and protect our patients. So normalization of deviance, this may be a new term to some, but um, will be uh, the concept is, is most appreciated by probably everyone on this call. To quote the iconic film star Audrey Hepburn, I don't believe in collective guilt, but I do believe in collective responsibility. To me, this quote encapsulates the epitome of causative factors in relation to unexpected events. We are, after all, human and imperfect. We all make mistakes. But we, what we do to prevent them is what makes us better as human beings and clinicians. The biggest mistake we can make as a clinician is to lower our standards and begin accepting shortcuts or deviations from approved procedures um, and now accepting them as the norm. This is known as the phenomenon as normalization of deviance. Diane Vaughn first used this phrase in her book documenting the Challenger disaster in 1986. Briefly, the engineers responsible for testing the Challenger continued to push the limits of a specific O-ring design, allowing for the acceptable range of damage to continue to widen. While launch after launch pushed the limits further out, the original abnormal range was accepted as the norm, leading to the disaster. Can we look at this event and apply the concept of normalizing deviance to our own units? Consider that the pathway to normalize deviance does not happen overnight, but becomes ingrained into our culture through repetition and rationalization as our behavior encourages complacency. I ask that you consider your place of work while discussing the following points. Variation in practice that deviated from hospital policy and procedure is common as we experience emergent and urgent situations in labor and delivery. Our decision making requires speed while performing patient care, and sometimes we do that with much haste. This can lead to shortcuts being taken, and peers observing these deviations begin to incorporate them into their regular practice without that the causative factor of speed being in place. This enforces that bad behavior to be replicated by others, subtly changing culture and impacting patient safety. The persistent risk-taking behavior leads to the opportunity for harm, and while well, the clinician underappreciates that domino effect that these shortcuts now have. So I wanted to highlight just a quick example of what I thought would be a common scenario on a unit. And um, I chose category two on purpose because we all know that 85% of our fetal strips fit in category two. Would be nice if they were all category one and 
even if they were category three, we know exactly what we're going to do because we're going to respond immediately. But category two catches everyone. So because it's not one or three, it's that lovely gray zone that causes the most angst during fetal assessment. It's the worst one to teach to a new grad or someone new to labor and delivery because there are some things that we see with our gut and utilizing all of our other five senses that we understand that we cannot share that experiential knowledge with the new staff. So why do we stare at it? Maybe we're hoping it'll improve. Unfortunately, time continues to slowly tick by, and without warning, it's been one hour, two hours, three hours, and the recurrent variables remain present. The watch and wait cycle has been perpetuated as a common approach. How comfortable are you with this pattern? Now, I only give you a few minutes to see, but let's say this is going on for hours. I'm sure you've labored a patient whose fetus was unaffected by this lengthy exposure to recurrent interruptions in cord circulation. That one experience when the nursery nurse came in, gave that baby a 99 F guard, and that baby looked just fine, clouds any more category two strips that look like this for the future. So although that baby may have been fine and had an I-9 APGAR, we become compliant with accepting the watch and wait approach and leave our patients in these patterns and put them at risk. So this, to me, is an example of normalizing deviance and our inability to remain objective because of preconceived expectations. A quick Google search reveals multiple malpractice cases related to category two with big dollars associated with the award. Case summaries indicated that doctors and nurses missed the signs that the baby was in trouble. Thus, the use of our artificial intelligence early warning systems to maintain objectivity may be a necessary tool. Alrighty, we're going to launch our first poll question. You should see the poll question on your screen. So let's talk about normalizing deviation around oxytocin administration. So in your practice, have you been exposed to the concepts of pit to distress or pit till you dip or make the baby prove themselves? Go ahead and answer that on your screen. We'll give everyone a few seconds to answer. Okay, we'll go ahead and close and share the results. Looks like 28% said in the past year, 26% in the past five years, 34% said yes, it was a long time ago, and 11% have never heard of that. Well, I'm, I'm happy to see that 11% of um, the attendees have never heard of that. Um, also ages me a bit, but, um, uh, but, but also concerning is that Oxytocin remains a, a high risk medication. It's black box label for a reason. So this, for me, um, you know, if we add up in the past year, we saw 28%, and then in the past five years, it's 26%. So, um, you know, certainly it does it does continue to be needed uh, to be labeled as high risk, um, and also uh, focusing our effort in that area to make sure that our providers and and that our um, RNs at the bedside are. Uh, educated on, you know, the, the pharmacology of oxytocin and, and what that's actually doing to the fetus and, and the maternal patient um, during administration. So, that's good data. All right, so let's talk a little bit about maternal patient safety, because if we're talking about normalization of deviance, um, you know, certainly the, the impact is, is on maternal patient safety. The Joint Commission identified several threats to maternal patient safety through um, the collated Sentinel event review data. 
um, which is, is free and available to anyone who wants to look at it. It's on the, uh, the web um, on their site. So I do recommend that um, quarterly you go out and pull that. It's a one-pager summary. Um, so it's very interesting to see where those events are occurring and, and what their causative factors are uh, overall. Um, through that literature, though, you can see that two separate pathways are distinguished to address um, solutions to maternal patient safety, um, the people in the process pathway. So um, for sake of, of our discussion, we're focusing on implementation of checklists, stop gaps, addressing the process issues through those multiple studies. But recently, literature has now shifted reduction strategies to be focused more in improving the areas of communication, culture, staff competency, and the environment in which we practice. So I'm sure if those of you have gone through job culture um, or have worked on, you know, changing your safety culture on the unit, you know, these things are very, very familiar to you. So certainly um, as an organization, we can make a difference. But my question to the group is, so how can we as individuals make a difference? Most quality improvement solutions need to be multidimensional, you know, certainly involve all of our disciplines. But we also need to focus our approach on choosing those strategies that assist with provision of fair and impartial care. We've already discussed the first, which was to avoid that normalized deviance, but we're gonna move on to the second one and talk about how um, we can be objective at the bedside. So I was very proud of myself when I put this slide together because I thought that um, it really uh, brought home to me, you know, certainly how my practice, um, you know, it, uh, surrounded my patient and and what subjectivity versus objectivity meant when I was taking care of those individual patients who, who came into our unit. So, you know, subjectivity is defined by, and, and this is Merriam Webster, but based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. And certainly we can all say that, yes, we are subjective about a number of things um, from your taste in um, in, in pizza to how you like to dress to, um, you know, the people that you are friends with. And then, and looking at the definition of objectivity, that lack of favoritism from one side or another and free from bias. And um, a lot of this really resonated, I think, because we are in this pandemic. Um, maybe I have more time for self-reflection because we're stuck at home. So, you know, I live in California, so still locked down. Um, but certainly, that comes into play and it's a little bit harder to do, right? We try to be open-minded, we try to think of others, um, but that subjectivity kind of blends itself in. So putting that patient in the middle, you can see that there's that dichotomy between subjectivity and objectivity. So um, most importantly, I want you to think about the times that you do care for your patient and how our own personal experience may impact our decision-making. Um, or challenge our plan of care uh, because of previous patient experiences, something, you know, that normalized deviance that really comes into play here. Poll question? I think we're going to go ahead and launch our next poll question. And that should come up on the screen. So, in your personal clinical experience, do you feel that labor and delivery is affected by subjectivity bias through personal preconceptions or data discrepancy? Go ahead and answer that on your screen. And again, we'll give everyone a few seconds to vote. Okay, we'll get ready to close it. To 94% said yes. So oh, this is Alana again. I, you know, I just want to say that thank you for your transparency and honesty because I feel like that's where this conversation really truly needs to start. And um, you know, when I was putting together the presentation, I just felt, you know, I continued to go back and think about situations where absolutely, you know, I certainly had subjectivity influence down. Um, my plan of care and, and patient care. So I, I appreciate that. And, and hopefully that, that helps with, you know, as we move forward through the discussion and things that you can bring back to your unit. So um, we're going to move on to the next slide, which is on self-reflection. Again, could be the pandemic, um, but it has certainly moved me into different directions that I don't normally um, 
spend time in, and that might have been because of the things that we were busy with before and being in lockdown. But, um, you know, when discussing how to be equitable and fair at the bedside, I, you know, there are so many rabbit holes, and I'm sure you've all done this um, because of the rising M&M &M rates. You know, you can do a Google search and end up, you know, all over the map in what you're looking at. But, you know, what I kept coming back to was the objectivity, and then that led me into well, how can I change that? Just me, not a checklist, not, you know, um, something that the hospital is making me, you know, fill out as far as documentation because it's required by a certain governing board, et cetera, et cetera. But how can I just look at it? So, so again, my rabbit hole took me down self-reflection of, of nursing practice, and I spent a lot of time there. And I wouldn't have thought I would, you know, looking at equitable and uh, fair and impartial care. But so here are some questions I put together. So, so think about your own practice and, and maybe just your own personal, um, you know, your own personal life and, and how these may, may reflect for you. So how do we provide equitable care if we have, we naturally have personal feelings, tastes, or opinions? I mean, you can't ignore that part of your, your psyche. It's there. Um, and certainly we can tell by the slide prior on the poll that it is not easy to remove ourselves and be, and, and practice outside of what has formed you as a human being. But, you know, um, understanding that most people on this call are clinicians, you know, there's a reason we came into the profession, um, whatever your clinical discipline may be. Uh, I know it's not all nurses, so I don't want to say just nursing, but I'm a nurse and I know why I became a nurse. So, so, so maybe just reflecting back to why you chose nursing in the first place, why you chose labor and delivery, you know, and, and to work with moms and babies. Um, it may be a difficult task to put those uh, feelings aside and provide the, the care the same way to every single person, but maybe it just starts with one patient starts tomorrow um, that you can make a difference um, in their care. The second one is how can we address subjectivity at the bedside, right? So we're already walking in. Um, we're taking care of our patient. We have our personal experiences. Um, they're going to influence us, but how can we do that? Well, just eliminate one. Just one. Don't don't try and eliminate your entire being because that's what makes you you. If there's one thing that you can work on that day, eliminate that. Maybe avoid a shortcut. Maybe instead of making that assumption with that patient, you move on and and say, "This is this is my sister." I mean, even saying that, I mean, your care probably changes. So, a couple of ideas. The next one is, can personal preconceptions about others affect our decision making? Absolutely. There are so many examples, and I couldn't find a lot on labor and delivery, but in nursing practice on how we manage pain. Just simply managing pain. We have personal preconceptions that affect when we medicate patients, if we medicate patients, how long we let them suffer, because that is a subjective data assessment. They have to tell us. We ask them to rate it on a uh, pain scale. We don't we don't assess their pain for them. So maybe just look at pain and make sure that everyone's getting treated the same. I know I can tell you I had frequent flyers that came through my triage unit and did I treat them all the same? Absolutely not because my frequent flyers were always there. Um, so I know that I had my own personal preconceptions from those patients. I mean. <laughs> by the name alone. We call them frequent flyers. So, um, just a few thoughts there. Not as easy as it sounds. So, supporting personal objectivity. Again, so much literature out there uh, in, in healthcare, not just nursing practice, but I did focus uh, on the literature that supported nursing practice and how we can um, remove that subjectivity bias at the bedside. Um, certainly, we have natural inclinations towards um, being biased, but um, we can look at refining those skills. So like I said, pick one and just try and master that. Controlling assumptions of the situation. Rely on your clinical judgment. I have uh, the, the nurses that I've worked for have always had great gut instincts. No matter what the patient was presenting, they knew. They knew stuff before we walked in the room. They're like, this is what's going to happen. I can tell by looking at her. You know, go back to what that was and how you truly relied on your five senses to, to take in and assess that entire clinical picture. Avoid behavior that supports normalizing deviance and be that role model. We all take shortcuts. I mean, 
Could I have somebody yell down the hallway to me, hey, I've got four units of insulin. Okay, I'm giving dibs. Okay, you know, could we always do that double check? Things are different now. We have, you know, we barcode meds. So there is that, that, um, that fail safe has been put in place. Again, better system than we had. Um, but is there an opportunity for you to say, you know what, I'm going to continue to investigate this category too. You know, I'm going to make this category 2A for me today, or this is category 2B. You know, split them up. Which one, you know, makes more sense for that patient's care? And then, of course, um, managing personal cognitive dissonance. We all have conflicting beliefs. You know, we don't take care of the same patients that we are or that represent our own personal beliefs. So we need to move away from that and make sure that we don't have those conflicts when we walk in a room. You can walk in a room and say, hmm, this lady looks like she may be at risk for shoulder dystocia, which I think everybody should be at risk for shoulder dystocia. I don't agree with a checklist only for those that meet certain um, criteria. I don't trust anybody. I always had a stool in my room. Always. It was one of the things I checked. I'm like, okay, I've got an IUPC. I've got a field step electrode. I have my call lights working, et cetera. And I have a stool in my closet because I'm five foot two. And I cannot climb up on that bed and try and do any sort of maneuvers without it. So, again, that's just, you know, you walk into a room, you're like, oh, she looks at risk. And then you don't put anything in place for that at risk, risk patient, even though your gut already told you that you needed to get that in place. A couple of the final points, nursing is an empathetic profession. It's our duty to respond with compassion every single time. Um, that's what you signed up for. And, and sometimes, you know, it takes, it takes a lot to get us to go back to that. And certainly being um, a bedside clinician during a pandemic, um, it's very, very hard. And um, we appreciate you uh, being there. And um, I wish more people understood, you know, the role that you play in the hospitals and taking care of our patients. Finally, um, just wanted to touch on utilizing technology. I mean, we have a lot of technology available to us, and some of it hasn't been helpful and has impacted nursing workflow in a negative fashion. But there is some technology out there that's been um, rather valuable and, and can benefit our patients and to ensuring that they uh, are safe. So um, we can look at these tools more from the perspective of supporting our decision making and then justifying interventions on that plan of care that we have in place. I saw this quote and um, I, I left this in here because it really resonated with me. Um, again, perhaps more so because it's a pandemic and everything <laughs> has some sort of uh, influence. So there's my subject subjectivity bias um, right there acting. Um, but it certainly it certainly uh, came home to me. So objectivity is seeing all the issues and feelings and contributing without bias. Objectivity is the absence of bias and not the absence of empathy. I know that, you know, you're currently busy. We're trying to complete tasks, protect ourselves, protect our patients, protect our families from contracting uh, COVID-19. It's more important now, um, and certainly with our uh, this current state of our, of our country, that we take the time to listen, deep breathe, and respond um, without, uh, without um, emotion. All right, so back to my flowcharts. Um, so you can see there's been a theme. This is the third time you're seeing it, but the third box is now filled out. So as uh, perinatal professionals, um, we need to be creative and think outside the box um, with regards to our approach to safe maternal care. This takes a coordinated effort for us to be transformational and lead uh, with, um, in some cases, um, certainly we are playing catch up in labor and delivery because as we all know, the house gets it first, and then they go, oh, yeah, what about OB? Um, so we need to try and catch up with healthcare delivery models and rely on, um, you know, how we can retrieve and receive that objective data technology and, of course, incorporate the art of our practice. By doing so, we can be successful in designing quality care for the maternal fetal dyad. Um, and now I think we're going to move into a discussion here about um, the uh, automated maternal early warning system. So a little bit about early warning systems, if you haven't had an opportunity to read, read about these. And um, so, so you know, I left one slide, and this was my dissertation from my doctoral project. So the fact that I was able to summarize it on one slide, I think is, is very good uh, on my end. 
Early warning systems are tools used by clinicians to identify patients in a worsening conditions. Obviously, these are tools that vary in design. So I'm going to show you some examples of, of the tools that are out there. Again, goes back to my we haven't standardized our approach. There are multiple ways of doing this, and you're going to see them. Some assign scores to the patient physiological parameters. Some assign a color. But breaches in those established thresholds, so no matter what form it looks like, they're still providing that notification that there's been a breach in those established thresholds, and they tell the clinician that the patient is not doing well, so that we can no longer continue to be complacent and ignore. So early warning systems improve the timely recognition, promote early interventions to reduce those, those unexpected outcomes. Now these tools, for the most part, the majority of them, reply, uh, rely upon objective data. So it reduces that influence of subjectivity, right? So it takes out our personal feelings because it's simply just the data. Um, and it enhances our clinical assessment. And then for me, you know, most importantly, it provides that justification for decision making. There's no more, I think, what if, it's, it's telling me. It's like, no, your blood pressure is this. You need to do something now. So discussing some historical context behind a maternal early warning systems, the literature, literature um, will prove to you that it's been in place for over two decades for the non-pregnant patient population. Again, they looked at them and then everybody forgot about us. These studies um, have shown that the, uh, the data um, that early warning systems can alert uh, the bedside clinician you know, up to 12 hours before an actual serious event is occurring. The alert criteria, based on vital signs are designed to prompt clinical actions in a timely manner. But setting these assessment times with specific routine and repeated intervals or whenever a trigger is found to have been breached allows for that judicious approach to patient care. So we can't just assign it out there without any specific guidelines on how to use it. I think that's where we've also come up short in taking early warning systems, adapting them to the maternal fetal population, and then didn't provide the, well, when do I use it? direction. So lucky for us in 2014, Meyer et al., um, that group reached a consensus on physiological parameters for the perinatal patient. The parameters provided the first step. So this is the first time that a group came together and said these are the, these are what the physiological parameters should be, the content of a maternal early warning system. Because before it was just um, using multiple layers of literature and deciding, okay, well, three of them said blood pressure 140 over 90, but you know, only one said 130 over 80. So we're going to go with 140 over 90. That's pretty much where all our sacred cows came from. Encouraging with those parameters built vigilance. It's our only automated maternal fetal early warning system, um, which assists the clinicians with application, appreciation of the patient's worsening condition, and to address our maternal morbidity and mortality rates. So that evolution of the paper pencil tool to a completely automated maternal fetal early warning system empowers our decision making. I think it provides us with a superhero uh, set of senses um, and, and improves our ability to really care for both the maternal and fetal patient. So here are some examples. I'm sure you've seen some of these, you know, um, but historically they were developed in, um, over in, in the UK. So that's where the, uh, most of the templates are based upon. Um, these are available in the references. If you'd like to go out and look at their programs, they do have everything available. Um, so uh, I encourage you to, to review them. I think there's a poll question coming up next. Yes, so the poll question should Hit and launch on your screen. So do you currently utilize a maternal early warning system? Yes, a paper tool. Yes, electronic maternal only system. Or yes, Prairie Watch Vigilant, the only automated maternal fetal early warning system. Or no. We'll give everyone a few more seconds. All right, I'm closing in just a second. All 
and we'll share those results. So it looks like 15% are doing it um, using a paper tool, 38% have an electronic maternal only system, and 8% have Paywatch Vigilance, the only automated maternal and fetal early warning system, and 40% currently do not have a maternal early warning system. So if we take the, the top three, and it's nice to see welcome to some of our clients that are joining us today. Um, if we take the top three, we're still seeing greater numbers that are taking the opportunity to look and use early warning systems. Um, I think that's you know, it's obviously a great step to reducing um, the risk for the maternal patient. Um, but I'd like to point out that you know, if we have the greater of our uh, numbers in the electronic maternal system only, um, what's happening with the other half? That invisible patient that uh, that we don't get credit for taking care of um, that's in the room with us also. So um, I'd like to talk about our maternal fetal early warning system and its benefits. So when you're thinking automated, this is powered by artificial intelligence, so I just want to preface that. So literature on the maternal death cases has shown that delaying care and timely interventions play a significant role in contributing to the unexpected outcomes. It also supports the need for early warning systems. So that's first and foremost, every time we read something, it says we need these systems in place. Again, we don't know what kind of form they need to be in, but they need to be in place. So the literature does support that. They are promoting a proactive response, response to patient deterioration. Instead of our current, and I wish I could see you, this, it's been difficult doing virtual um, you know, presentations, but so if I could see you, I would probably see some head nodding. We do reactive response most of the time. Proactive response would be so much better, and there would be less sweating and less running and less crashes. Um, and that, excluding those truly emergent situations. So I'm not ignoring uh, a prolapsed cord, you know, an abruption, a rupture, not those things. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about that, that case example where we sit and we watch our category twos slip into really ugly looking category two strips and then eventually, you know, we've got a crash or a floppy baby comes out and we don't know why. Um, so that's what I'm referring to. We need to get back to being um, more reactive, or, oh, sorry, more proactive than reactive. So, so let's talk about early warning systems. Um, when they're automated, they're simply calculators. They're simply adding up those breaches that you told them to watch. So if you said, you know, I have a blood pressure of 160 over 110 and I have a pulse of 110, I want to be notified. Well, it's just simply doing its job. It's adding it up, going one plus one equals two. I'm letting you know. So, so that, that's where the objective data comes from, right? Um, it, it can, it, what it does is it'll prioritize the clinically relevant patient information. You know, it gets rid of that extraneous subjectivity bias. It gets rid of any other noise. It just says, hey, you told me to tell you. I'm telling you. You need to do something about it now. I made you look at it. Now do something. Um, automated early warning systems for the maternal fetal dyad provide that objective identification of at-risk patients, it immediately starts to move them up the board. So instead of everybody just being entered on the board, you know, in what room they were in, if, if I'm in room 284 and I'm at risk and, and the system is notifying you that something's going on, made to look, my blood pressure is out of whack, I've got a category three strip, it's gonna shift me to the top and say, you don't have to worry about the ones below me. These, this is the patient that everybody needs to be, be aware of. Right here, it's sitting right here. So again, brings that highlight to the top and it's promoting that, that at-risk notification so that we watch the right person. It fosters collaboration and communication throughout all stages of that perinatal care. So if you have an antepartum patient or if you have your postpartum patient, you can scroll back and look at her vital signs. You can go back and look at her strips. You can do a four hour or 12 hour trend view and have an opportunity to have a really good caregiver handoff session contemporaries in the now we get an opportunity to really see hey well, what's going on with that patient and again this will date me but when I started in labor and delivery I would have to take the the paper strip the red paper strip lay it out in the hallway and see what was going on for that patient's labor I had really good preceptors 
hate to brag, but they were awesome. And they showed me to do that. When you come on, you don't just take what's being printed out. You take what those chapters were before that and take a look at what's been going on with your patient all day. You're responsible for all day, not just because you weren't there. So that eliminates that. I can look at it. I can see if the system was telling me it was bad. <clears throat> it also supports provider decision making through utilization of this artificial intelligence. So when I make a decision at the bedside, or if my doc comes in and makes a decision, you know, we can see that there's a reason. You know, it's not, again, just relying on, on gut. We're saying, okay, the clinical picture is this, the data is telling me this, now let's make a decision. So I'm going to hand the presentation over to KK. Um, she's going to discuss our, our automated early warning system vigilance. Um, and uh, I, yeah, we're just going to switch over because it'll go to KK's screen. Hello, welcome, it's KK. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, while Elaine has been talking, I have been watching the chat box, the questions, and do know we will get to them as soon as we have some time. So thanks for sending them in. Um, I do wanna give a big thank you to Alana for once again delivering a terrific webinar with current timely quality content. She outlined the benefits of automated early warning systems for mom and baby. And I'm here to give you an overview of the Vigilance Early Warning System. I do want to tell you a few things before I dive in. It is an early warning system for mom and baby, not a documentation system. So you are not going to be charting in here. We're going to take charting that you have already done in your either surveillance system or your EMR and map it into ours. It aggregates that data from your fetal monitor and your EMR, it analyzes it and gives it back to you with the actual notifications, objective information about that patient situation. It's a quality improvement tool. It does not send information back to the permanent medical record. And the goal is to provide caregivers with timely notifications of potentially worsening conditions. So you can assess that patient intervene as necessary and potentially avoid that delay in care. So without further ado, on your screen, you have what we call the multi-patient view of vigilance. Over on these left-hand columns, you see patient information. That is information feeding in from your ADT system. Here you have patient information about their OB status. That again is feeding in from wherever you've documented it in your current systems. And then you have your vigilance column. So you have CURVE, which is an er objective early warning system for progression in labor. You have your vital signs. So your parameters would be set here to whatever your facility already has in place. As Alana pointed out, there are some variances in early warning systems. We will match whichever ones you use so that you get notifications when you are above or exceed parameters that you've set in place. And then lastly, there's the cues column. This is objective early warning for potentially worsening conditions in the fetal tracing. And you will get an orange notification. You can see in vigilance, orange is our way of saying, you've breached a parameter of sorts, please take a look, probably need some assessment and potentially interventions to prevent that worsening condition. If you had this patient right here, you see there are, there's problematic right here, and also we're in a positive cue state. So something's been going on in that tracing and actually for quite some time. Let's see what's happening and see what we need to do. So this top panel here is your pattern recognition. If I hover over any of these findings, you see it will tell me more about that finding and give me a confidence interval for that. It is colorized, so here I have a variable deceleration, it's yellowish. Um, if I had accelerations, they would be colorized green, green, happy, go. Yellow is starting to get concerning, and those findings that have more implications for fetal acid base status, so variables that break the 60 by 60 rule, late decelerations and prolonged decelerations, they are colorized brown, so the darker the coloration, the more concerned we are. If I hover here, it gives me information about the uh, uterine status contractions. 
um, and up I hover, it gives me more information about how long those contractions are lasting. Um, one of the things that makes most nurses very, very happy to learn is that if you have an IUPC, it will calculate MVUs for you. Over to the right-hand side, you have a summary of what has happened in the last 30 minutes in this tracing. And again, you have your orange icon that's calling out, please take a look. Something is going on here that has breached a parameter and is concerning. And in this case, as you can all see, we're in a state of uterine tachycystole. So that's why we colorized orange. I'm gonna click right here and show you the algorithm that is working in the background. So this is the objective early warning system for a baby um, against the tracing that is going on in the background. So on average, over the past 30 minutes, if your tracing has less than six beats per minute of variability, so apps are minimal, and no 15 by 15 A cells for that 30 minutes, then you're gonna turn orange. Um, I need to point out again, this is an early warning system, okay? So is this a hair on fire? Is this a run to the OR? Like Alana was talking about, those emergent situations? No, this is early warning. Let's go in and see what's going on. Is this kid sleeping? Is this kid sick? Let's go assess and find out. So if we have late decelerations greater than or equal to three during a 30 minute period, we are going to turn orange. If we have decelerations greater than or equal to two that break that 60 by 60 rule, we're gonna turn orange. And then if we have these combinations of decelerations, we're gonna turn orange. Lastly, if you have a contraction count greater than or equal to 16, you're going to turn orange. That 16 sounds funny to us because we know our NACH definitions. If you take that 10 minute definition of UT, extrapolate it to 30, this is your uterine tachycystole. So this is the algorithm running in the background. It may look familiar to many of you. It's a well-evidenced oxytocin checklist that's been used in the industry for quite some time. And this pattern recognition that you're seeing here has been NICHD validated. So there were MFMs that reviewed the tracings. We sent it through our algorithm and there was substantial agreement with the MFM. So you basically in the background have another set of well-trained eyes all the time, 24 seven, for another layer of safety for mom and baby. This is the trend view. This is what Alana was referring to, doesn't necessitate us to unravel our strips in our rooms or in our hallways. You can see very quickly, either four hours of trend or 12 hours on this page. And all I have to do if I wanna move through hours and hours of tracing is just move this slider window and I'm able to review all that tracing. And then wherever this slider window is, above I see large. This trend view is important. We made 12 hours purposefully because we know hospitals tend to function in 12 hour shifts. You know, if you think about your handoff, your SBAR handoff, if you have your SBAR and you have this, you have all the information you need so you can give a complete assessment for mom and baby. Again, if you have concerning trends occurring, you're gonna have them called out here to the right with that orange icon, please take a look. Vital sounds are trended here. If you have outlying measures, you're going again to be called out with orange. Um, and then it gives you a, a very nice trend view over time. I can tell you the other beauty of this system is this window is all time aligned. So if I look back here, these are the events that were occurring at th that time. If I scroll, it will time align all those events. So you have the, the baby tracing, you have maternal vital signs and your labor curve. So lastly, the labor curve. This is a more modern labor curve. It is not Friedman, it is not Zhang. It is based loosely on Zhang, but we have many more parameters that are used in our labor curve. It is an objective measurement of the labor progress. Um, if we look here, we have a, a zone of normal that's colorized, and then you have this dotted line, which is your 50 percentile mark. This black line is the mom's curve and it will be updated every time that a provider, a healthcare provider puts a exam into the chart. You'll update the curve and then over to the right here in the summary, you have your percentile. And importantly, on the top you have messaging and it would tell you whether this is it within normal range. Um, your other messaging would be that this labor has slowed or there has been not been dilatation for a certain amount of hours that would turn orange because this is early warning. Let's be proactive. Let's go in and assess and see what way you can do to support that labor and support that vaginal birth. 
So that was Vigilance in a Nutshell. I'm going to hand it back over to Lexi. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, KK. And I am just going to give you guys um, just some final notes. Let me get my screen up here. There we go. So um, we have a few resources available for download based on the presentation today. Um, again, we appreciate everyone attending our webinar. And, um, you know, we all have the same goal of promoting the health of all moms and babies. And especially during this pandemic, um, I just can't even put myself, you know, in your shoes. So really appreciate what you're doing and anything we can do for you, um, we're happy to do. Um, so we thank you. There is a survey that will appear after the webinar, you know, let us know um, how we can improve. And also if you have suggestions for other, um, other topics that we can cover, we'd love to hear them. So thank you.